Hey guys, this is Dr. Joel with Metamersion. You are watching a flash flood review series video where I review the highest yield stuff for your board exams in as little time as possible. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the potassium channel blockers, which are a class of the antiarrhythmic agents. I'll cover some general principles about the class as a whole, and then a few specific drugs in that category or in this class. It's going to be awesome, so stick around. If you watch a lot of Metamersion videos and they're helpful for you, think about getting an account at metamersion.com. That will speed you up in your studying because when you're logged into Metamersion on your browser and use the links in these videos, you will automatically skip past these lengthy introductions on my Metamersion videos and also on other people's videos that I've linked to. And you'll be able to skip over a lot of the YouTube advertisements on my Metamersion videos. Okay, let's jump into it. This lecture is going to cover a subset of the antiarrhythmics, the potassium channel blockers. I'll give you an introduction as to what they are, then talk about some general principles that will include the mechanism of action, clinical uses, adverse or side effects, and then I will cover a couple of the highest yield examples in this class. All right, first of all, if you need to review the entire topic of the antiarrhythmics with a little bit of cardiac physiology, you should really go over and watch the antiarrhythmic agents lecture first. This lecture right now is a little bit more focused, and I assume that you know um, a couple of things about antiarrhythmics. So the potassium channel blockers in the Von Williams antiarrhythmic agent classification are the class three antiarrhythmics. You should know that. And we use the potassium channel blockers and the class one or sodium channel blockers for rhythm control. The class twos and class fours are more rate control. Four drugs that we're going to talk about, amiodarone, abutilide, defetilide, and sodalol, which you can remember by the mnemonic AIDS. As for the mechanism of action, these block myocardial potassium channels, and that has its primary effect on the specific potassium channels that are responsible for the delayed rectifier current, which have a very important contribution on the length of the action potential and thus the effective refractory period of cardiac myocytes. And to explain that a little bit further, have you ever wondered why exactly the action potential of a neuron through the, the spinal cord or a peripheral neuron looks different than the action potential in myocardium? Well, it's built that way on purpose. The plateau phase or the prolongation of the action potential or the refractory period gives cardiac tissue special properties that prevent it or contribute to prevention of arrhythmias. So the picture on the left is what maybe a bland neuron action potential might look like in the peripheral nervous system. On the right, we have a cardiac action potential, and both of these are pretty bland images. They're not exactly right, but the point here is that there's a plateau where the cell stays in its non-polarized state for a little bit longer, for a period of time. Potassium plays a big part in that. The initial depolarization is caused by a rapid influx of sodium, and then it's maintained in that depolarized state by both calcium and potassium trading places across the cell membrane in relatively small amounts. In phase three, which is the repolarization phase, finally there's a delayed switch or a delayed rectifier current of potassium which finally turns on and allows an efflux of positive ions allowing the membrane potential to come back down to a very negative number. So hopefully you can see why if we mess around with the potassium channels that contribute to phase three we prolong or at least change the shape of the cardiac action potential which, of course, would have an effect on some kinds of arrhythmias. So it was pretty easy to see, I think, from that previous picture that delaying the potassium efflux during the repolarization phases 
increases or stretches out the action potential duration and also the effective refractory period. Also, these do not have any effect on the sodium channels, meaning that the conduction velocity or phase zero wouldn't be affected or decreased. And visually, it looks like this. The action potential uh, stretched out and the effective refractory period is increased. Also, that means that the QT interval is prolonged. Okay, does that make sense? We use the class three antiarrhythmic agents for rhythm control. Because they change the effective refractory period, they can help cancel out pre-excitation accessory pathways and other mechanisms by which you might have a tachyarrhythmia. So like AFib, A flutter, V fib, and V tach. Also Wolf Parkinson White syndrome which is a pre-excitation syndrome um, that uses a uh, accessory pathway. So as for the adverse effects or the side effects, in this slide I'm really going to talk about these drugs as a class or as a whole. And I will talk about the individual side effects that each drug is famous for in the next or upcoming slides. So. As a class, these drugs are famous because of the reverse use dependence principle, which means that their, their effect or their prolongation of the action potential duration increases at lower heart rates. Well, that's not where we actually want the drugs to work. We want the drugs to work at high or fast heart rates, tachycardias. So this just increases the susceptibility of the myocardium to early depolarizations at low heart rates, which is why these drugs aren't wildly popular. We use them, but there are other drugs that we use before them oftentimes. So a huge side effect of these drugs, which you have to know, is that they increase the risk for tersades. Now to talk about a few individual drugs, starting with amiodarone. Amiodarone is five out of five. You have to know this. This is a very important drug. You're gonna see it and you're gonna be asked about it in your clinical rotations. It's important because we use it in ACLS and also for other arrhythmias in the CCU. And the numbers on the left-hand side of every bullet are the yield or the importance of each point of data. So starting first in the mechanism of action, slightly different than what we've previously said, Amiodarone actually has properties of all four of the classes of the antiarrhythmics. That, that's pretty cool and that's important. The next two bullet points there in the mechanism of action we've already talked about and we should understand. For clinical use, five out of five ventricular arrhythmias, VTAC, VFib, you got to know it. Slightly less important than that is AFib and uh, much less than that like we don't use it at all really for a flutter, but, but it would work, it would have some effect. Side effects, the first, second, and third, thyroid toxicity, pulmonary fibrosis, and hepatotoxicity. You need to know those. That's why they say, remember to check your PFTs, LFTs, and TFTs when starting amiodarone. It's true, those are very common side effects and you're gonna be tested on them. Less frequent than those top three are some of these other lower ones which you can commit to memory if you want to, but as long as you have the high yield stuff, you're probably gonna be good for your tests. Next is abutilide, which is slightly less high yield than amiodarone. I'm gonna give it a four out of five. There's not a lot new here about the mechanism of action. However, the clinical use shifts just a little bit. This has a little bit more use in atrial arrhythmias. Um, so like AFib and A flutter. Side effects, torsades, I talked about that. Torsade de point is an important side effect for these drugs, and possibly this medication could cause hypotension. As for the last two class three antiarrhythmics in this discussion, uh, these two are even less high yield than the previous two I've talked about. Defetilide, I'm gonna say it's a two out of five, and uh, Sotolol, maybe a three out of five, just because Sotolol has an interesting point about it. Defetilide, pretty dangerous drug. There's a lot of first world countries who don't use it or it's not available in because it's so dangerous. In the United States, you need special training to even deliver it. So not real common. 
Sotalol is interesting because it has, in addition to its class 3 antiarrhythmic properties, it has a little bit of class 2 activity as well. It non-selectively binds the beta 1 and beta 2 adrenergic receptors, which makes it unique and therefore makes it interesting and therefore makes it fun on tests. So you should know that about Sotalol. However, if you're crammed for time, I would focus on the first two drugs that we talked about and save these if you have time later. All right, guys, knowledge challenge number one. What is the mechanism by which cardiac cells maintain their electrochemical gradient? And actually, this would apply to neurons as well. Well, the answer is A, the sodium-potassium ATPase, or the sodium-potassium pump, which pumps three sodium ions out for every two ions of potassium that it pumps in at the cost of ATP, which is why B and D are wrong. Technically, if I would have flipped those so that it said sodium efflux and potassium influx, you could have argued that, hey, that's what the sodium potassium pump does. But that's not what I said. So you're wrong, 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 wrong. And C is also not correct because that's an enzyme that converts ATP into cyclic AMP, which isn't important in this particular mechanism. Now let's challenge number two. Which phase of the cardiac action potential is the plateau phase? Well, the answer is phase two. Phase zero, which isn't one of the choices, phase zero is the rapid depolarization phase. Phase 1 is a initial repolarization phase, followed by phase 2, which is the plateau phase, followed by phase 3, which is the complete repolarization, and phase 4, which is a resting phase. Knowledge challenge number 3, you're almost there. Good job if you stuck with it this long. Which Von Williams antiarrhythmic class do the beta blockers belong to? Well, Dr. Joel, you didn't talk about the beta blockers in this lecture. You are cheating, sir. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Class 2. The beta blockers are class 2. Class 1 are the sodium channel blockers. Class 3 are the potassium channel blockers. If you don't know that after this lecture, then I am a terrible teacher. And class 4 are the calcium channel blockers. Okay? Thanks for watching, guys. Hey, look, if this video helped you, if you liked it, please support Metamersion by giving us a like or subscribing to the channel or heading over to metamersion.com and setting up an account. Shoot me a comment at any time. I do my best to answer students because I love working with you guys. Also, you can support us by going to the upper right-hand corner here and making a donation to Metamersion just to help us keep the website up and running. Other than that, Good luck in school. Hang in there. You can do it.